Hello, and welcome to Washington State History Distance Learning with Ms. Jarman. Today, um, we've got about 100 years to cover of the history of industry in Washington State, and those uh, machinery noises behind me just kind of set the mood now, don't they? All right, here we go. Time to learn about industry in Washington State. Now, before we launch into the history of industry in Washington State, let's just take a moment to situate ourselves in context. Um, long ago, since time immemorial, thousands and thousands of years ago, the people who lived on this land um, believed in what we've been calling land-based values, working um, in harmony with nature, in cooperation with nature, still using nature as a resource and still kind of dealing with the obstacles that nature presents, but in a way that really puts human beings in cooperation with the world around them, land-based values. And so it was on this land for thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. And then in the 1800s, things start happening very quickly. Um, we start making contact with people from other cultures, other parts of the world. First came the mountain men, the fur traders, who were um, here mostly for the beaver and other critters. Then came the missionaries, who were on a mission. They really, really believed in their heart of hearts that they were helping Native American people by helping um, them become Christians. So they were on a mission and they were the missionaries. And then finally, and in the largest numbers, came the immigrant, people call them settlers, I guess, because they came here to settle. We call them immigrants because this was not the United States at that time. This was actually 30 plus independent nations. So as these people come, they also bring with them um, a very different set of values. And those values are um, what we've been calling Judeo-Christian values from the Bible. And this is directly from the Bible, from Genesis. Humans control nature. See, there's the human at the top. God commands them to conquer the land and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the fowl in the air and over every living thing that moves on earth. So this worldview, um, uses the resources and removes the obstacles in a kind of a more um, maybe like forceful way. Um, it uses the resources not just to sustain themselves and to keep going for one more day, but to sustain themselves for a long, long time and to further sustain themselves by making money off of them. You get it. Let's move on. We've talked about this a long time. I think you get the difference here. So two very different ways of seeing the world, but what we're looking at with these early contacts is that now that these two very different values are coming into contact with each other, there's gonna be some merging of these worldviews. And when you merge those two worldviews, you end up with something that, um, even though it kind of preserves each worldview, humans on top, humans at one with nature, this human is on top of this human. This is what I'm calling colonist values. And this is colonization at its core. These incoming colonists can't and won't see the indigenous people, these people, equally as humans in their own right. They see them the same as they see the, uh, the plants and the animals and, and all the other things and the rivers and the rainstorms. They see them as a resource and to a greater extent, um, the colonizers see the indigenous people as an obstacle, as something that is in their way. A big part of those Judeo-Christian values is dominion over the land. And dominion over the land means drawing boundaries, make it official. Which humans 
have dominion over which land. That matters when you're talking about dominion because there's a lot of profit to be had. There's a lot of safety to be had in clinging on to your one piece of land. So boundaries are an important piece of this. And because colonist values don't recognize indigenous people as fully human, they were pushed onto these reservations to make room for the colonizer's way of life. So everything you see in sort of that light orange color represents um, an area called a reservation that at the time were kind of carved out. And then, you know, the colonizers, these folks said, okay, you guys, indigenous people, you can continue to live here, but you're in our way. We want to put a railroad through here. We want to put farms in here. We want to build some, some industries in here. So you're going to have to move. And so they, they had to move. You know, they, they didn't want to move. They fought it and, um, and tried to reason and then tried to fight for as long as they could. Um, but this is basically what ended up. So everything you see is Washington State and everything you see in that light orange color were the reservations at the time. And as such, Washington officially became a state in 1889. By then, the native population had gotten so much smaller from disease, from the wars, from displacement. Meanwhile, the non-native population had grown to nearly 350,000 people. So here they are, these people who came west, these non-native people who now basically own this land and it is the state of Washington. Are they gonna use that land the same way that the people before them have? Are they going to hunt and gather and fish and farm and follow the seasonal rounds? I mean, basically, no. Um, these non-native people, even before Washington had become a state, once they were living there, you know, they had their own habits. They had their own culture. They had their own practices. And these new people, they were not interested in adapting to the land. They needed the land to adapt to them, which leads us to industry. And we're gonna think of industry as making money from processing raw materials and manufacturing goods in factories. So instead of just, you know, going fishing and catching one salmon and taking it home and eating it for dinner, now we're gonna have companies catching lots of salmon and processing them and shipping them off for lots of people to have dinner for lots of money. Let's take a look at some of these early individual industries in Washington State. We're going to cover about 100 years of Washington State history in the rest of this lesson. But first, I mean, 100 years is a long time, but let's put that into perspective. So I brought the since time immemorial timeline back. And you'll recall that, you know, it's that the Native people did not measure time in a line. They measured it in um, more of a, a spiral, a circle. And their seasonal rounds calendar was a circle. I'm just going from season to season to season. So the piece of history that we're going to be talking about today is just this little yellow spot right here. That yellow spot represents a hundred years um, that we're going to be looking at in this lesson. Now, a lot happens in this hundred years, but in the grand context of things, it is it is tiny. So um, let's zoom in on just those hundred years. Okay, and here's a, a really zoomed in version of that 200 years. Um, as you can see, 1889, this is when Washington becomes a state. So long before Washington was officially a state, industry was already you know kind of happening here it started um you know with with the first white people of european descent coming here and bringing their way of life with them 
I guess we could say technically um, an industry economy was already starting with the fur trappers and, and maybe the farmers a little bit in here, but where we, where we really want to start looking at it is in 1853 and the lumber industry, or sometimes called the timber industry. Lumber and timber are both words that refer to um, cutting down trees and processing and selling the the wood for one thing or another, the lumber industry. Now, obviously, you know, chopping down trees and using lumber to build houses and to build barns and whatnot started the minute uh, people started settling here. But um, where it really took off was in 1849 with the California gold rush. They discovered actual gold in California. Gold was discovered in a lot of other places too, but California is where there was a lot of it. And so, you know, what would you do if you found out that gold was just like running wild somewhere and you could just go grab some gold and it would be yours? Everybody was going to California to get some gold and get rich. California isn't super close to Seattle, but Seattle was probably the closest place to California that had that much lumber to sell. So they needed that lumber in California. Lots of people were moving there. They needed it to build their, um, for their gold mining operations, but they also just needed it to build all these towns that were springing up. All these towns that were filled with new people looking for gold. So meanwhile, north of California, not participating in the gold rush, but in 1853, one of the people who first established Seattle as um, a, a, a city, a city, you know, for white people of European descent, um, he chose Seattle because he thought this would be really convenient for just taking all that lumber, putting it on a boat and sending it down to California. So that man's name was Henry Yesler, and there's a street named after him in downtown Seattle and probably some other things, too. And in 1853, he built the first uh, steam-powered sawmill in Seattle. Uh, a sawmill is like basically a kind of a factory for sawing and processing a lot of wood at once. And more sawmills opened, and pretty soon Washington's lumber was being sold in Hawaii, Australia, as far away as China and England and France and Spain, and of course in cities in the United States. So lumber was one of the first big industries here in Washington state. And I talked about fishing before and, and boy, this is really what it looked like in an industry. These were called the salmon canneries. And yes, those are salmon all over the floor. Let's just take a moment. Look at those salmon all over the floor. Holy moly. All right, I'll tell you a bit about these salmon canneries. So back when all these um, immigrants were coming to um, the Washington Territory, they thought they were going to be farmers. That's what they knew how to do. Well, what they found was that farming was pretty hard in Washington State because on the west part, we have all these forests and hills and all these trees. And, and in the east, there's practically desert and, and um not a lot of water and so hard to get things to grow. So farming here in the Washington Territory days was not ideal, but there was plenty of salmon. So around the 1860s, um, they came up with the technology of canning. Think about this, cans don't just come to the store. They, um, they have to be made, and then somebody has to take the food, get it cleaned up and ready to eat, put it in the can, seal it in the can. So that technology was invented in the 1860s, right around here. And in um, 1866, um, one of the first canneries opened right along the Columbia River. So how this worked is that um, fishermen would catch loads and loads and loads of salmon. They would bring it to the factories. These factories were called canneries because they put things in cans. And then the people who worked in the canneries would clean the fish, cut the fish up into small pieces, 
and then pack it into cans and seal this raw fish right in the can. And then once the salmon was sealed inside the cans, then they would cook it right in the cans. They would cook it with really hot steam. And then once the cans were ready, they'd put the labels on them, they'd pack them in crates, and they'd ship them off to markets in Oregon and California. And then over time, um, once we had the railroad and, and more ways of getting things places, canned salmon was being shipped all over the world. Um, canneries and... Hmm, hold on a second. Yes. So um, this is going to come up later, and some of you, if you have Miss Ellison or Miss Brown, you um, you learned about this a little bit last week. But um, many, many, many of the folks who worked in the canneries were immigrants from China, and a lot of them had come to the West Coast. Well, come to this country first for the gold rush, because you know gold. Who wouldn't want to try to find some gold? And when the gold rush didn't work out, um, many of them came north and got jobs working in these canneries. By 1869, just three years after that first salmon cannery opens, we see the completion of um, what we call the first transcontinental railroad in Washington state. Transcontinental, we can break that word down. Continental means the continent, obviously. Trans means across. So a transcontinental railroad means that this train goes across the whole continent. Remember, there were no cars. Basically, the only way to get around was um, involving either a horse or a boat or, you know, a wagon pulled by a horse or a boat. So the railroad was going to change everything. Suddenly, um, people could get in and out of Washington State faster, and it wasn't dangerous anymore. And by that same token, um, people could get their, um, their goods in and out of Washington State, so they could ship their cans of salmon off to be sold. They could ship their lumber off to be sold. The railroad was a game changer. And I'd mentioned before that um, immigrants from China were finding work in the salmon canneries. Um, immigrants from China were also heavily employed building the railroads, as um, those of you who have Ms. Ellis and Ms. Brown and, and Ms. Martinez, I think, too. You guys learned about that last week. I'm going to cover that again a little bit next week. But just, just to point out, like this is the time when, along with industry and more jobs being available, now the immigrants are not just um, white people of European descent from the eastern United States. Now the immigrants are coming from all over the place um, for these industry jobs. Um, immigrants from Japan, um, immigrants from European countries like Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, but also Greece and Italy, and Ireland. And after the Civil War, when slavery finally, finally became illegal everywhere, many people who were free now didn't want to keep living in the places where they'd been enslaved, understandably. So they came north and they worked on the railroads too. So all of this new technology is creating jobs and drawing more and more people to Washington State. Like I said, railroads are making it easier for the canning and lumber industries to ship and sell their stuff. And then the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad also just made it much easier for people to move to Washington State. So more people did just that. And diversity was increasing. It was not just white people immigrating here anymore. It was people uh, of all colors from all over. Uh, sadly, that means, you know, that we're going to start seeing a lot more discrimination. Many of you talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act last week. I'm going to get into that in more detail next week, um, along with a lot of the other discrimination that came along with that. So now I'm going to just sort of fast forward through this um, chunk of time. Um, the major industries that I talked about were lumber, and canning and the railroad, but there was a lot else going on in Washington State too. Um, lots of commercial farming was starting to happen in the eastern part of the state, 
apples, all those apple orchards in Wenatchee and Yakima and other parts of the state. Railroad is still going strong. Lumber is still going strong. And this, I hope I, I, hope I got the right picture. I was trying to get a picture of an old paper mill. And these are related because, um, as some of you probably already know, um, paper is made out of trees. So after these guys would cut down a big chunk of tree, you know, they'd ship it to the paper mill where it would be cut up and boiled in a lot of chemicals and mushed and flattened and made into some delicious paper. If you've ever been on a tour of the Seattle underground, maybe you did in elementary school or maybe with your family, then you'll know about this. There was another gold rush, not the California one. This one was in Alaska. And lots of people were coming to Seattle, not to live here, but just to stock up and get ready to go up to Alaska and look for gold. So lots of business people in Seattle made a lot of money selling things to the folks who were headed up to look for gold selling them clothing and gear and tools and dog sled dogs and just all manner of stuff. So that's another emerging industry in Washington at that time is retail. During this time when there's more industry than there's ever been and there's more workers than we've ever had, we're also seeing um, in addition to just the economic growth, more money is being made. We're also seeing a kind of social progress. Um, before there were rules about this kind of stuff, um, in order to make as much money as they possibly could, some of these businesses hired um, children to work there. And it was very dangerous, and it kept the children out of school and basically just away from their childhood. But um, it, that was a thing that happened that became illegal in like the late 1800s. Also, um, women in Washington state got the right to vote 10 years before the rest of the country did. They advocated for the right to vote and they got it in 1910, votes for women. And another form of progress that we see during this time is the, the start of labor unions and striking. So as I was saying, you know, in order for the, the owners of these businesses to make a lot of money, not only were they hiring little children, but they were just basically not paying their adult workers very much money at all, paying them so little that they could barely afford to live on it. And there was no such thing as the weekend back there either, guys. People just worked and worked and worked until they dropped. Um, so labor unions was all these workers coming together and saying, well, well no, actually, we, um, we are risking our lives. These jobs are dangerous. We want safe working conditions. We want to make a living wage that is enough money that we can actually afford our homes and our food and taking care of our families. And one way to really communicate that and let the business owners know that, hey, you need us, maybe you should pay us more money, is that they would go on strike. So this is a time when not only are we seeing a lot of growth in industry, but we're seeing a lot of social progress too. People standing up for their rights and rights in some cases for the first time really being established. You know, we have a weekend now. You don't have to work in a factory now. Women can vote now. Good stuff, progress. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the shipyards, which became a very big industry in Washington State too. Shipyards are, are basically factories where boats are built and repaired. So one of Washington's first shipyards was established in 1891, just shortly after we became a state in Bremerton. It was the first of its kind in the Northwest region that could repair really large ships. And then another early shipyard um, opened on Lake Washington in what's now Kirkland. So they just went about, you know, just being a place where broken boats could come in to be repaired, broken ships could come in to be repaired. But then during World War I, shipyards expanded and they started building ships 
as well as repairing them. Um, this was because, you know, now there's a world war going on and they need many, many more boats and ships for the war effort. So these shipyards in Washington state built hundreds of them and repaired the ones that were damaged in battle. And then by the time you get to World War II, shipbuilding was a huge industry in Washington state, employing lots of people. Um, well, the working conditions were not always fair or safe, as I talked about. So that led to more organized labor unions and more strikes. And there's one very big strike that you'll watch a video about this week. And here we are, the moment many of you have been waiting for. Um, in the start of the 20th century, we get Boeing. Just take a look at that early seaplane. Look at it. I believe that's Lake Washington. No, I think it might be Lake Union. I don't actually know. But look at it. Isn't it cool? The early days of Boeing. Because that is it. Like right at the beginning of the 20th century, the technology was emerging. People were trying to figure out how to build airplanes, how to fly airplanes, how to build better airplanes. And uh, a man named William Boeing, who came from a, a family that was in the lumber business, was fascinated with airplanes and flight. This was just brand new technology. Imagine, like growing up your whole life, Flying is not a thing that exists. It's not a thing that's possible. And then suddenly, as you're just becoming a young adult, flying is possible. So he loved it. He became a pilot in 1915. And then a year later, he and a business partner um, had an old, they bought an old shipyard and they founded a new company to build not ships, but airplanes. So like the shipbuilding industry, this airplane building industry really, really took off during World War I. Um, they needed warplanes for the war effort. Now, after World War I was over and they didn't need warplanes anymore, things kind of slowed down for Boeing. So Boeing started to think, well, what, what else can we use airplanes for besides, you know, fighting in wars? So they started working on making airplanes for people to use um, for non-military things, like delivering mail and transporting passengers. And then by World War II, and we'll watch two videos about this today, uh, World War II really, really increased the demand for warplanes again. So between all their military customers and their civilian customers, and just the drive and the innovation, um, Boeing became and remains a major business in Washington state. So there it is, about 100 years of industry crammed into a few minutes of PowerPoint. Um, that's the first part of the lesson. What we're going to do next is we're going to look at um, four really major things that also happened during this time. I'm not gonna talk your ear off about those things. What I'd like you to do instead is um, scroll down. There are five different short videos for each one. And along with each video, there um, is a, a thinking routine that goes with it. Don't be scared, it is easy. It's just a way of kind of getting you to think about and talk about the, um, the information that you're learning. The directions are written at the top of the video. And please, please, please message me if you have any questions about it. This is um, kind of a heavy, content heavy week again. So if you want to, you can just hit stop and sign out and just have this video be all that you do today. And then come back and watch the other videos tomorrow. Maybe watch one a day. It's set up so that you can stop and start and just submit the work as you're doing it. Um, but really, like, give it your full energy and attention, whatever, however that works best for you, because it's, it's a lot that we're covering, and it's a lot that I, we're asking you to think about. All right, that about wraps it up for the PowerPoint lesson piece of this lesson, and um, go forth and watch those videos. Message me if you have questions. 
Go back and rewatch if this was too much, too fast, and didn't make sense. Watch it in little pieces at a time. Um, have somebody watch it with you and talk about it later. Really, um, one of the nice things about these being recorded is that you can engage it in lots of different ways. All right, and um, that's it for the PowerPoint. See you next time.